of this categorification to the arrow polynomial. If you don't know what the arrow polynomial is, you will in a little while. Um, it's a generalization of the Jones polynomial. Um, and uh, this is uh, joint work with Heather Dye and Vasily Monturov and Aaron Kastner. Um, here are some references. Um, one reference, well, there, there are a lot of papers about virtual knot theory, but, uh, but if you wanted to get a picture of uh, the definitions and so on, you could just go to this more recent one of mine. Um, and this uh, talks about the arrow polynomial and the generalizations of it. Um, then there's a specific uh, paper about the arrow polynomial by Heather and myself. And um, there's a paper by Heather and myself and Vasily on categorifications of the arrow polynomial. And then there's some work that will appear with Aaron. Um, I'm going to begin by reviewing some things. So in case, um, in case you find that uh, something you didn't want to listen to very carefully, I give you a puzzle. Um, you can chalk this down, dot the diagram of this down, and, and see whether it's knotted or not. Um, and of course, I recall for you that uh, a knot theory can be done combinatorially by the Rademeister rules, but I won't say too much more about that. Um, I need to review the, a bracket polynomial model for the Jones polynomial and, and the usual formalism for categorifying that due to Coban. So I remind you, I'm going, so the first part of the talk is going to be some reminders about that and notation and grading and things like that. So, um, so here's the bracket polynomial written in the usual form with an A and an A inverse and the value of the loop is minus A squared minus A to the minus 2 and, and it has this framing behavior. Um, uh, I'm using Kovanov's convention to rewrite it. Um, which is essentially to multiply the bracket in A by A to the minus the number of crossings and then rewrite with a Q so that the value of the loop becomes Q plus Q inverse and the minus sign gets transferred up into the stain relation and only the B type crossings and I call that crossing with a, with a Q multiplying it a B type crossing only the B smoothing I mean only the B-type smoothings are getting a Q and a minus Q at that. So this is just a, a rewrite of the bracket. And then I will be using enhanced states, uh, which were introduced into this situation by Vero, um, by labeling each loop with a plus one or a minus one. And so the value of a loop, instead of being Q plus Q inverse, is either Q or Q inverse, depending on whether it's labeled with a plus one or a minus one, and then you expand the bracket with states that have their loops labeled plus or minus one, and you get a sum of monomials as a result. Um, and then also, uh, because later um, we'll want to be labeling with uh, things other than plus or minus one, so we'll be labeling from, the, from an algebra, I tell you immediately that the convention is that minus 1 corresponds to the variable x and plus 1 corresponds to 1. Um, and so, for example, uh, if you had this state where you had two 1s and a minus 1, then, uh, then you would get uh, minus q's from the b's, because they're all b smoothings, and you would get two q's and a q inverse from the loops, and that would be the monomial that corresponded to that labeled state, and the, and the bracket polynomial is then a sum over uh, all those monomials like that, like this, q to the j of s times minus 1 to the i of s, where j of s is uh, contributed to by the number of b smoothings, and there's a minus 1, that comes from that, and it's also contributed to by the number of plus ones and the number of minus ones involved in the state labels. But, uh, but all the minus ones in the monomials are counting the number of Bs, B smoothings. So that's the raw form of the polynomial. It's a sum of monomials. And now uh, I'm going to go over to the Kovana homology picture of this. Um, and so the complex in this case for the homology is uh, given by the states of the bracket itself, 
the boundaries are generated by re-smoothing uh, from A's to B's. Um, and each loop, um, each loop which is not any longer uh, labeled with enhanced state labels but can be, um, it corresponds to some module on which the boundary operates. But of course, in fact, we're going to find that the module is generated by the different labelings of the loop. Um, so I said this already, and I'm just going through this rapidly for you, just to remind you that the boundaries are obtained by re-smoothing, and consequently, a loop may go to two loops, or, or, or two loops may go to a loop. Uh, and from the point of view of some module structure, that means that it looks like you have either a co-multiplication or a multiplication that has to be operating here in order to compute the boundary. The boundary, of course, is a sum of these partial boundaries with appropriate signs if you're doing it over the integers, and just mod 2 summing otherwise. Um, one wants the partial boundaries to commute. Um, and so you can t take a typical situation like this, where I have one and two are the two possible smoothings that I'm going to do, and I want them to uh, give me the same result no matter what order I perform them in. So uh, in order to have that, it turns out that it's exactly the same as asking for the patterns of, of uh, two-dimensional surface cobordisms, um, and it also corresponds to putting algebra on the on the modules which satisfies the Frobenius conditions. And finally, just quickly, um, here is uh, the original example of such a, an algebra which works nicely. So the algebra is, is the polynomial ring on x modulo x squared equals zero and the, and the coproduct of x is x tensor x and the coproduct of one is one tensor x plus x tensor one. And then everything works nice and compatibly. For example, here, if I were doing this and I labeled x and 1 to begin with, then you would go to x tensor x here, and then I'm multiplying, and I get x tensor x in the end, or um, I multiply, and then I co-multiply, and I get the same result. And all of this works just fine. Um, and now we want to think about one extra, couple of extra technicalities about the way things are indexed here. Um, the J um, in the monomials was the number of B smoothings plus what I've, written, what I've called lambda here. And lambda is the number of plus one loops minus the number of minus one loops. And, um, and so uh, you could collect those all up together um, and you get that it's the sum on powers of Q multiplied by the dimensions of Cij, where Cij is the module that's generated by the enhanced states with a given number of B smoothings, and J is above. Um, and, um, and then the wonderful fact uh, about the way the combinatorics of that algebra and, uh, and this interact is that the boundary map preserves J, as is easily checked. So that means that you actually have a whole series of homology groups that you can, homologies that you can compute depending on fixing J. And, and then when you rewrite this sum, you, uh, you oh, I'm uh, saying the same thing on this slide, so I'll just move forward. It says that boundary is preserving J. Um, then when you collect, collect up that sum, you're looking at an Euler characteristic of the J complex. Each is a subcomplex on, uh, on which the homology works. So you get the homology of the J complex summed over j, q to the j, and that's the sense in which, and specifically with respect to these gradings, that's the sense in which it's an Euler characteristic. It's a graded Euler characteristic like that. So there's the Corvano homology giving rise to the Jones polynomial in the form of this shifted bracket. Okay. Um, so um, we're going to be looking at a generalization of the bracket where I'm adding orientation structure. Um, and the orientation structure that I'm adding is simply that I'm looking at an oriented link and I'm expanding the bracket just like I usually do, um, except that I keep track of the combinatorial orientation structure even when it uh, looks reversed as it does when you take the B smoothing here. Um, so if you continued and wrote out state sum that way, you would have states with a lot of uh, these little cusps in them. 
Um, and the question is, how much of that combinatorial structure can you keep and still have it be invariant under the Rademeister moves? Will you get some kind of generalization of the Jones polynomial with more structure if you play this game? And the answer is yes. Uh, and there's more than one answer, but the simpler answer that we're looking at here is uh, that we won't insist, for example, that the two cusps remain paired. But we'll just look at state loops with lots of cusps on them. And then the question is, do you have, can you keep all the cusp structure or do you have to release some of it? And the answer is, you'd best release some of it if you have two cusps that are parallel to one another like that in the first box, they should cancel. If you just adopt that rule and don't adopt the other, any other cancellation, if you have a zigzag, they won't cancel. Um, then you can easily see, by just looking at the usual proof of invariance of the, for the polynomial under the Reitermeister moves, that it's going to be invariant. So that means that you now have a generalization of the Jones polynomial where the state loops have lots of little cusps on them. Um, and if two cusps go parallel to one another, then they cancel each other out. And if they zigzag, they don't cancel each other out. Uh, however, if you think about a state loop with a zigzag in it, if it ended up canceled down to just a single zigzag, and you ask yourself, could that happen? You realize at once that it can't happen for a classical knot diagram because you're sitting there with this zig inside the uh, Jordan curve of the loop, and, um, and it, has to map, it has to be paired with somebody, and you'll just go on forever uh, descending into uh, and pushing the difficulty around. So it won't happen for classical knots, so therefore you should just forget it. No, not quite, because you could think of, um, of a situation where it does happen, namely if you had a knot which is uh, in a thickened surface, um, so it has a diagram which looks like it's drawn on the surface. If you had a knot like that, uh, why then indeed you could have zigzagging cusps like I've shown you here in this example. That's a perfectly good zigzagging cusp state. And furthermore, if you were to take projection of that into the plane, then you see that you're, it's natural to consider diagrams in the plane where you have some virtual crossings, crossings that aren't really there um, if you were to resolve it into a knot on a surface. Um, so that's uh, one of the ideas behind virtual knot theory, but even without what I'm going to define as virtual knot theory, you have immediately the theory of uh, knots in some given thickened surface, and then this generalization of the Jones polynomial applies, where you have the zigzagging states that you can keep track of, uh, and that would be an arrow polynomial for the knots in the thickened surface. Um, and that's not a, a version that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to just go over to the usual uh, formulation of virtual knot theory, which stabilizes uh, the surfaces away. That is, you can think of knots in a thickened surface, sure, but you're most interested in those knots which really use all of the genus of the surface. Uh, so if I had one drawn locally on that torus, I would just as well put it in the plane. And that one actually hugs the whole torus and doesn't need uh, a higher genus. So, um, so one can um, stabilize the situation. And that's what virtual knot theory is from this point of view, um, that you think of knots in thickened surfaces um, up to stabilization by ha adding and subtracting handles through which the knot does not go, doing those handle surgeries. Um, and of course, homeomorphisms of the surface as well. Um, on the other hand, these uh, projection diagrams that are suggested by looking at this uh, can be made correct. You can, you can do the stabilized theory by using these projection diagrams and taking them up to a set of moves on the diagrams. And the set of moves on the diagrams is simply uh, that you let the virtual crossings behave as though they aren't there at all. Um, and what I mean by that formally if you want to make a set of Reitermeister moves, is the moves on the right. Um, with respect to each other, the virtual crossings uh, behave like flat Reitermeister moves, and two virtual and, uh, and virtual crossings with respect to real crossings act like they are detours that go from one point to another 
and consequently you can cut them out and put them somewhere else. So C there on that slide is the simplest example I could draw of a detour move, but what I mean more generally for a detour move is that you have a consecutive sequence of virtual crossings and you clip the uh, line of the diagram from the beginning to the end of that sequence and then just reconnect it somewhere else and uh, that's the equivalence relation that actually corresponds to this little set of Reitermeister moves on the right. But if you want to formulate in terms of local diagram moves, then these are useful. And if you want to formulate virtual break group and other things, then it's important to have the local diagrams like that. Um, um, there's some other remark I wanted to make about this. Right. Um, another variant of this, which is useful, is flat virtuals. Because as soon as you take these rules and, um, and say that you have two types of crossing and let the guys on the right just be flat crossings, then uh, there's an asymmetry here. The virtual crossings are allowed to pass across real crossings, but the uh, real crossings are not allowed to pass across virtual crossings in the sense of that detour. And then you get quite non-trivial pictures uh, of situations which are actually pictures of immersions in surfaces. So there's that variant of the theory as well, flats or virtual strings, as uh, Dryaf calls them. Um, I feel like there's another remark I wanted to make. But I'll, I'll just repeat what I said before implicitly, which is that this diagramming system for flat, uh, I mean planar knot diagrams with virtual crossings, is equivalent to embeddings of knots and thickened knots and links and thickened surfaces taken up to handle stabilization. So, um, so it's just a question of which way you want to look at it. It's also equivalent to taking Gauss diagrams, arbitrary oriented Gauss diagrams if I'm oriented, Gauss diagrams uh, and doing Reitermeister moves on them and that's it. Okay. Um, so those are two, two directions. One is highly combinatorial. Just think of Gauss diagrams alone, which is the point of view that Polyak, uh, Vero, and Gusarov were taking in their paper a long time ago on this for the purposes of Vassiliev invariance. Or you can think of it very geometrically as stabilized knots and thickened surfaces. So there are a lot of different points of view here. Um, one last thing. Um, if you're looking at a virtual knot diagram, because the virtual crossings really aren't there, what you're really talking about are the crossings, the ordinary classical crossings. You have a bunch of them, and you have line, four lines going out of each one, and those lines are, the diagram tells you that this line is connected over to this one, and that's all it tells you. It just tells you who's connected to whom. So that's one, another way of thinking about it that's like a Gauss code. You have a bunch of crossings, each one of which has four labels on it, and, and then the label on this crossing, one of the labels on this crossing matches a label on some other crossing and it's just a set of little circuit elements that are wired together in that way. So for coding purposes, uh, that's um, in a way the most useful thing for us, our purposes, we like coding it that way. So that's virtual knot theory. And then you'd like to compute the error polynomial. I just wanted to give you a hint about what computation looks like. So this is what I was saying. Uh, here are some crossings and they have labels on them, uh, and uh, you can tell a computer that it's a crossing with those labels and they go around in that order and it's either positive or negative. And then if you smoothed it, you can give it some other local symbols that tell you that C should be equal to B, um, but it's just a formal symbol that says C should behave as though it's equal to B, and so you would have an identity that says that if you have delta AB and delta BC, then you'd have delta AC. That will get you uh, that will get you the usual things. But then what about these cusps? Well, um, we'll call them LEDs rather than DELs. And then the basic rule about canceling of cusps is that LEDAB, LEDBC is del AC. And LED depends on order, whereas del doesn't. Del AB is equal to del BA. It's just saying that they're equal. But the cusp depends on the order in which you traverse it, so that if you have a cusp and another cusp, then they should do each other in. And zigzagging cusps won't do each other in, and so that's the only extra bit of formalism that you need to introduce into some computer program which is expanding things out in this way. So this isn't doing homology yet, but that's the basis of 
of Aaron's later programs, which uh, and, uh, which do homology, and, and Dror's earlier programs, which do homology for Kovanov homology. So, for example, um, a program that just computes the arrow polynomial in Mathematica is very short. Looks like this. It's just keeping track of the LEDs, uh, and in the end, the state loops come down to some funny collection of symbols which won't go away, and then you use the computer to uh, turn those collections of symbols into names, and we call the, uh, I, I better go back for names, come back, there, yeah, um, so you want to name the state loops uh, that have the zigzagging in them, and so uh, it's just an integer number of zigzags, and you can't tell when it's a, when it's a closed state loop whether it zags and zigs or zigs and zags. So you just count uh, a positive uh, integer for the non-trivial state loops, and we call them k1, k2, k3, and so on. Okay. So this is just summarizing what I said. You can get, you get a uh, so-called arrow polynomial, and uh, it's invariant under all the Rademeister moves if you normalize it in the usual way. And you get an invariant of flats or virtual strings, if you like, uh, by just specializing it to a equals one. And this gives lots of non-trivial information. Here's an example of a, of a final calculation of something. There's the Kishino diagram, which is hard to check. Uh, using simple invariants, for example, the Jones polynomial doesn't see it. Uh, and, and you get some polynomial involving these extra variables, the ki's. And one theorem that's quite nice to know about, uh, uh, which Heather and I prove, is that, uh, that the virtual crossing number, the least number of virtual crossings in one of these diagrams, is bounded below by the degree of the k's. That is, for example, k1 squared is giving us a degree 2, and the k2 is giving us a degree 2. If you had k2 cubed, it would be giving you a degree 6. So you see what I mean by the degrees of the k's. So the maximal degree of the k's um, is a lower bound for the virtual crossing number, and in that case, proves that the Cassino diagram has crossing number 2. Uh, that crossing number is like in graph theory. Uh, the crossing number of a graph. You have a graph uh, and you try to represent it in the plane and you get uh, a lot of lines that cross over one another. Um, it's not quite related to the genus in which the knot sits because you could start with a knot on the torus and it wraps around the torus quite a lot. And then when you try to correct, get one of these projections, uh, there will be a lot of crossing number. So uh, the crossing number is a bit mysterious for virtual knots and just as it is mysterious for graphs. You may or may not know, since not everybody thinks about graphs, that there, it, it isn't even known what the, virtu what the cross, virtual crossing number of the complete graph on M uh, nodes is. Or that, uh, when, I, when I say the virtual crossing number, I mean the same thing. This graph is projected into the plane, and you want to know how many crossings it, are forced in there. There's a, there's a specific conjecture, which you can check on the web if you're interested in what it is, for the complete graphs, but it's only known specifically for a few of them, and then it's a conjecture. It's been that way for a long time. Problems about crossing numbers are hard. Um, here's a question. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, so uh, I, I, I used that diagram with malice of forethought to remind you that uh, I am not allowed to um, move uh, uh, a consecutive sequence of real crossings across a virtual crossing. I'm allowed to move a consecutive sequence of virtual crossings across a real crossing because they aren't there. But uh, if you start to think about what this really means, um, it really means that it's on a surface and you're allowed to move, you're allowed to stabilize handles on the surface, but that, but that, that doesn't tell you that you can move things across handles. That would be changing uh, by much more than an isotopy in the surface. So, so the obvious move that is suggested on that diagram isn't one that you can perform, uh, nor does it keep the Gauss code. If you're thinking in terms of the Gauss, Gauss diagram, it doesn't keep the Gauss code either. So it's just not allowable. 
even though your your um, your visual intuition keeps wanting you to move that. So you you should probably think that there's a pole that uh, goes straight down through the plane through the virtual crossing, but somehow these poles get to annihilate each other when you have them in pairs. And you do. <laughs> I don't know how what what you should do. This is, is reminding me of a friend of mine told me how to drive in Europe. He said, "Well, I always think of myself." as being magnetically attracted to the left-hand side of the road. Maybe it works. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, it, also, it's worth mentioning that you could take this forbidden move and allow it. Um, and there are two of them. There's the one where two things go under and you slide it under. And there's one where two uh, go over and you slide it over. Um, if you allow both of them, then the knots all dissolve. If you allow one of them, you get a non-trivial theory. And uh, in fact, it has a lot of uh, uh, topological interpretation associated with it. So, uh, and we call it welded knots, and it goes back to welded braids of Rourke, Fenn, and Remiani. So if you quotient by that move you would like to perform, you actually get something interesting. But if you quotient by both of the moves that you would like to perform, you don't. Okay, uh, and here's an example. Let's see how we're doing. Um, here's an example of calculating the arrow polynomial. Um, as you see, the, one of the states is picking up a zigzagging loop, and so you end up with a K there. I won't do more complicated examples. Ah, but I did put one other example in here just for fun. Something I was thinking about recently is if you do a long knot, well, it's a phenomenon that's interesting anyway. You see, here's a, a long knot, a long virtual knot. Um, and if you close it, if you close the two ends, then it's trivial because this is two, two, a randomized or two move and it pulls in and goes away. Since you can't do the move that Olga wanted to do, um, as a long knot, it doesn't look like it's going anywhere and it won't. It, it's not trivial as a long knot. So this is a phenomenon about virtual knots that doesn't happen in classical knots. You can have a long knot that's non trivial, and when you close it, it's trivial. Um, the rest of the slide is illustrating how the long part of the state could have some zigzagging in it, and that will appear in the polynomial and so on, but I won't bother you with it. Um, so now what we want to do is use the arrow numbers, that is the number of zigzags on one of these uh, states, to create some extra grading and thereby generalize the categorification of the Jones polynomial to a categorification of the arrow polynomial. That is not so much that we're going to give you uh, a homology theory whose order characteristic is going to be equal to the arrow polynomial, but we're not doing that. But we're going to use the grading, use gradings that come from the arrow structure to get uh, a somewhat more refined homology theory. That's the aim. Um, and so one wants to think about what happens when you combine states with arrow numbers, how would they change? Um, and so this chart is showing you what can happen. You might have, uh, you might be combining, re-smoothing, and then there are a couple of cusps there, and they both disappear. And if you think of a little bit about what happened to the arrow numbers, which are the absolute values of the number of zigzags and again, then if they might add or they might subtract in this case. Um, and, and similarly, going back and forth this way, and you might have a virtual crossing in, the, in a state, and you go from that state to a state with a single loop. And that, of course, is one of the problems about thinking about Kovana phonology for virtual knots, is that there's a single loop map, like I forgot to mention, I could have mentioned earlier. There's going to be some single loop maps in the Kovana phonology. And, um, and one way to handle that is to just do it mod 2 and realize that everything works fine. Even, you just set this, the single loop map equal to zero. That's the simplest solution. And then ordinary cohomology, ordinary homology is a, is a theory for virtual knots. There are more uh, refined solutions due to Montura, but we'll just stay with that one for the time being. And, um, and so these, this is the way the error numbers behave uh, when you do that. So now comes the question of how to handle um, an extra grading situation. So the idea is to, is to have some grading that you've defined on the states, and then 
insist that the grading be preserved when you apply the boundaries and mod out by, uh, by parts of the boundary that don't preserve the grading and make that still give you a homology theory that's invariant. So, uh, so I'm going to spend a, we're, we don't have a lot of time, but so I'll go through the uh, uh, formalism here a little bit. So we're going to talk about this in terms of assigning dots to some of the state circles. Um, and we want the dotting to be additive with respect to the 2 to 1 bifurcations and the 1 to 2 bifurcations mod 2. Um, so that when you merge two circles, the number of dots on the circles being operated on is preserved modulo 2. Um, if, you, if you think about the, what I'm saying here and remember the previous slide, you'll see that counting the number of, uh, counting the arrow number modulo 2 will work for these conditions. Um, and, um, and, and then if you do a Reitermeister right move, then you, you can look at moves, at curves that have a similar structure before and after. You want them to have the same dotting. And small circles that appear uh, when you're doing the second Reitermeister right move or third Reitermeister right move expansion, they shouldn't have dotting on them. Um, and then we'll use the dotting to get a grading that we want to preserve by taking the number of x's minus the number of 1's, which is the sort of thing that you're preserving before, and, um, and um, asking that the number of dotted x's minus the number of dotted 1's should be preserved. So, in particular, um, if you just take the arrow number itself, modulo 2, and do this, then it works. That's the first categorification of the uh, arrow polynomial. So you just do that and you get uh, a categorification of the arrow polynomial. Um, oh, I guess I don't want to talk about the generalization just yet. Let's just stay with that. So, so that, that um, isn't too complicated. The next one is a little more complicated, but this is actually the one where we found some examples that it detects. So, um, so all we're doing is, is keeping track modulo 2 of the number of, um, uh, of the arrow number, of the number of zigzags, and then asking that that be preserved when you, uh, when you that, the, that the number of uh, dotted x's minus the number of dotted ones be preserved when you, when you do the boundary, and modifying the homology in that way, and getting a new homology theory. So that's the, maybe the uh, best one at the moment, in that we know that we can do some calculations to see that it does something, but I'll tell you quickly about the generalization. So if you want to go to some kind of an integral grading, um, um, then, well let me see, what, what, do I have, what have I told you here? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I haven't really told you much of anything yet, here that's new. This is what I just said. but. Um, uh, then we're going to introduce somewhat more complicated gradings, and I'm just going to go through this quickly. Um, um, there are two types of extra grading, and then these two gradings are going to interact with one another to produce the grading that we want for the more general thing. Um, a multiple grading is a set of integers that's associated with the state of the diagram, um, and those integers are just going to be the integral arrow numbers. Um, uh, then there's going to be a vector grading, and this is the subtler one, where you look at the arrow number and you factor off a power of 2 from the arrow number um, and see what, how high a factor of 2 you, 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 you pull off of it. And then you think of that as an entry in a vector somewhere down, far down the vector, the number of the, how far down the vector you are is the height of that power of 2. And then you decide, uh, then you check to see whether you have a, uh, an x or a 1 on the line, and you put a plus or a minus 1 in the vector according to whether you have an x or a 1 on the line, but it lives in the vector according to the power of 2. And so that means that um, that means that it will be shifted in the vector according to um, and according to how even that vector is. And then we combine these two uh, gradings, the vector grading and uh, and the other grading, to form a double system that's asked to be preserved when you do this. Um, and then 
that still works. Um, it's a little more complicated, but it works. Um, and the sort of thing that you need to check, and I'm not going to do any checks here, is you need to check configurations of this sort that contain basic configurations that contain a virtual crossing um, uh, of, of different forms and also half links, things like that. Here's an example of the sort of splitting and recombining that you have to think about um, when you're checking preservation of this sort of grading. You see you might have an A and a zero and then it might turn into an A and a zero and a B and, and recombine and so on like that. And you want to make sure that these commuting squares still work. Um, and uh, it's under those kind of circumstances that this extra divisibility works. So that's a very quick description of this more general one. And I'm going to end with a couple of examples. Um, these are two knots which are not distinguished by mod 2 Kavana homology or by the arrow polynomial. And they are distinguished by that first categorification of the arrow polynomial. The one that's keeping track of whether they're an even or an odd number, uh, odd number of zigzags on the lines. Uh, so here's one. What you're seeing below here is, uh, is a summary polynomial of the ranks uh, and the quantum degrees as you, in the usual way. Um, but um, that's one. And here's the other. They're very different looking knots. They have exactly the same arrow polynomial. And they are distinguished by, uh, by this categorification of the arrow polynomial. The difference between these two summary polynomials is a little bit here like that. Um, these examples are small enough so that we, Aaron and I, have been intending to write out the entire complex uh, somewhat more explicitly and try to figure out exactly where it, the difference occurred. But there are lots of puzzles about examples of this kind. Th these are not just simply mutants of one another. In fact, the second one, as you see, is a connected sum. And if you look carefully at the guy on the right, uh, the closure of it is trivial. So this is a little like the Cascino. Um, and um, so the question, so there are lots of um, questions that are not really Kovana homology type questions, they're just questions about the invariant, uh, such as how do you really understand what kinds of knots have the same arrow polynomial. But the fact that it can be distinguished by this invariant is very interesting. Here's to end a little bit of information about uh, this search. Uh, Jeremy Green's tables, those are the ones that are on Drawer's website, there are 2448 five crossing virtual knots that are tabulated. Uh, there are 28, Aaron found 28 sets of knots with the same arrow polynomial. And within each set, there are some have different categorifications. Uh, the two knots in the previous two slides have the same arrow polynomial, that's what it is. Um, getting back to that kind of nitty gritty, you see that's degree two. Um, so, uh, so that says that the crossing number uh, is at least two, and as you see that one is two, so the crossing number of this one is two, but the crossing number in the picture of this one is three, and uh, neither Aaron nor I have been able to reduce it. So it may be an example uh, that uh, shows that you can have crossing number three even though the estimate is two, but we don't know yet. I don't, in other words, I don't know how to prove that that has three. Um, so there are lots of questions um, about this situation, and this is just two examples out of a whole range of examples that we're in the process of finding more, out, more about. So to summarize, the simplest categorification of the arrow polynomial, the one where you just keep track of, uh, of how many zigzags there are in a state modulo 2 and use it to get a better boundary, uh, does give some information about virtual knots and, and, and the arrow polynomial. And there are lots of questions about this situation.
those two examples? Is it different? No, it's the same. It's the same. Yeah. Are, are you using an expert C2 rating in order to did I understand it correctly? You're using an expert mod mod two rating in order to categorize virtual mods? Yeah, putatively, um, I, I, what I'm doing is I'm counting how many zigzags there are on a curve, right? So that gives me an odd, uh, that lets me label each curve odd or even. Um, and then uh, I, count, uh, I count how many, uh, how many, uh, uh, how many uh, curves are there that are labeled X. Uh, how many dot, I, I'll say that an X is dotted if it's on an odd curve, okay? So how many dotted, F, and a 1 is dotted if it's on an odd curve. So how many odd x's, how many dotted x's minus how many dotted 1's are there is the grading that I want to preserve. Yeah. Whereas usually you'd be looking at just how many x's minus how many 1's are there. So it, it's not that I'm, 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 so then I'm throwing away the rest of the boundary operator. I'm only... I'm only allowing a boundary operator that's operating on that part. If you want to think of that as a Z2 grading, you can. Yeah? You said that by categorification, you were trying to enhance the grading rather than find some sort of characteristic with error polynomial. Have you thought about the latter question? Yeah, I, uh, it, I don't have a, a formula that says that the Euler characteristic of this thing is going to be that. Oh, but let's see. I guess I haven't thought about it. If I do take, yeah, I guess I, I guess your question really is, um, is there a way to take an other characteristic of this that'll give me an invariant polynomial? And I didn't think about the combinatorics of that, but maybe that's true. But it probably won't be the error polynomial. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, so the, so the homology theory is always modular, too. That's right. at all related to, um, to, the, to the, 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 um, the generalization of Kibana homology to links and thickened surfaces due to Asayana, Shidizki, and Shikora? Um, right. So there are generalizations of Kibana homology to links and thickened surfaces. And, um, and uh, as I was saying, that's another project, certainly, to instead of using virtual knot theory as the base on which you operate, assume that the link is simply given in a surface, then you have the extra structure on the curves in the surface, and there's more to do, so it's quite probable that, uh, that the kind of thing that we're doing will give something more powerful for links in a specific genus like that. Heather? Uh, I think Vasily knows how to do it um, with, over the integers. But, I mean, the, the paper that Lou is talking about is, is very long. So, uh, you know, so we just, you know, it's not a good thing. Well, well so, I guess, in, yeah, I guess there are a number of features. One is that we didn't, we, we well, but more recently we realized we didn't fully understand the integral theory. But, but, but on top of that, when we were trying to use the integral theory, assuming that we understood it, we still didn't see uh, how to how to make this grading uh, business work. I think it does. Or do you know how to make it work? Well, maybe, maybe. But I think the silly does, does understand it, and uh, even uh, even though we're we're a trifle stuck, and I I think he, he knows how to do these with the integers. He's just busy doing other stuff right now. We'll ask. Yes, it's fine. Right.